There we go. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, another lecture given by Meridian Soul School of the Highest Learning. This is our Monday night basics and foundation class. Oh, uh, let more people in. Um, we were going to do the moderation, but we're going to just jump right into it and just do the aims. And then we'll um, do a prayer and then we'll do a scripture lesson and jump right into it. So the aims and objectives of the school are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity and Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, sex, creed, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and power Satan and man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the studies of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult sciences. Fifth, to extirpate, extirpate excuse me, current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby men must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. We have a prayer by Miranda Gonzalez, and then we have a scripture lesson by Vanessa Collins. Scripture lesson will be Exodus, the 24th chapter. Good evening, class. <clears throat> Let us bow our heart, mind, for prayer. <clears throat> our most gracious Heavenly Father, Yahweh, we are thankful and grateful that you have kept us during this journey, during this wilderness of our mind. We're thankful that you have laid down the footsteps, the landmarks for us to use to <clears throat> come on into the Holy of Holies. We're thankful for the purging of our heart and of our mind so that we can receive this gift, so that we can see you clearly in us. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to gather together, to sup with the brethren, to hear, share, and partake of this basic and foundations class, for it is just that. It is the foundation of our faith. So as we gather tonight, we ask uh, on an individual basis that you give us what we need, as you always do, and keep us focused in on those things that are good and pleasing in thy sight. These are our blessings. We ask in our son's name, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening. Scripture lesson for this evening is Exodus 24th chapter. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments. Critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by the late A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association Incorporated. Exodus 24th chapter. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh had said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning 
and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh had said, will we do and be obedient? And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which Yahweh had made with you concerning all these words. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day, he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus 24th chapter. Hallelujah. All right, class, good evening again. My name is Carla Carter. I'll be the moderator or host for this afternoon's um, or evening's lecture slash class. This is a little, it's a lot more informal than normal class. So we'll be going back and forth. We'll be talking back and forth, going over some scriptures, kind of getting into details and kind of pointing some things out. It's not just a lecture based like the normal Sundays and Wednesday classes are. So it's more, um, I guess you would say informal and more hands-on. And so we will have an assignment at the end of the class. Um, hopefully what we'll um, learn today is basically the order in which Yahweh did these things with Moses and the reason why it's important to know the order. So with that being said, the assignment was to read Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 24th chapter. So we're going to go back to the 12th chapter and we're going to go over some things there. So um, we won't read every chapter tonight because it's too much reading to do. That's why we're supposed to do homework, but we'll kind of go through some of it. And so in the 12th chapter of Exodus, this is when Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron when they were in Egypt and told them to take out a lamb because Yahweh was going to um, put the 10th plague on Egypt and kill all the firstborn in Egypt. And all that did not have the blood on the door, then there was going to be um, the firstborn son dead in their household. So, that being said, who wants to go first to share what um what you saw or any questions you have on the 12th chapter of Exodus? I know maybe you probably got Michael on 10, but it's okay. This is informal, so it's okay. If you need to um, unmute yourself and he's in the background. Anybody want to go first? I know the first go around is kind of, you know, we'll just be standing around looking at each other. Anybody want to go first? Go ahead. I'll go. If nobody want to go first. I'll kick it off. Okay. So it's the twelfth chapter we're talking about first. Yep. Okay. Well, um, right, and uh, I think it's uh, right at the beginning of the chapter. You know, Yahweh. Uh, 
established, yeah, sorry, y'all got to forgive my baby in the background, but he established what the uh, first day of the year, I mean, the first month of the year was going to be, which was a bid, um, which corresponds to our month of April. Uh, so that's important to note. Um, then he also mentioned that, uh, you know, they were going to take a lamb on the 10th day of that same month of April, they're going to take a lamb, uh, according to the, you know, uh, according to, you know, for each house. And that lamb was going to have to be without spot and blemish. It was supposed to be a male of the first year. And they were either mm -hmm. going to take it from the sheep or the goats. Now there's a lot, or are we talking about principles? Or I'm just reciting what, you know. No, it's the principles, like whatever, Yahweh moves, oh. whatever you saw when you read it. Okay. Yeah, well, obviously the lamb is referring to Yash Messiah, the, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the lamb of salvation. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And um, that lamb being without spot and blemish is referring to Yash Messiah, it's pointing to him being without sin. And they were also uh, required to inspect that lamb to make sure it had no spot and blemishes. That means checking every crevice, every crack, uh, every crevices of it. And in doing that, they were inspecting it to make sure it was, you know, it was as it should be. So that was pointing to Yashi Messiah. He also had to be inspected. And uh, his occurred through Pontius Pilate when they, uh, when they, you know, arrested him and brought him in. They, uh, Pontius Pilate, he interrogated him. And at the end of this interrogation, he, he concluded that he said, and he said this, I find no fault in him. Meaning, you know, he didn't, he didn't sin. He didn't deserve death. You know what I mean? So that's what's all that's pointing to. Uh, a male of the first year, Joshua is the first fruits of them that slept. So, um, and that's what I saw out of that. And then uh, they said, you pick that, you take that lamb on the 10th uh, day and then you hold it over until the 14th day. So what that tells me is that that lamb, what, 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 what that first day, what, what's, let's, let's say it like this, zero has no numerical value, right? So, uh, when you, when they picked up, when they took that lamb on the 10th day, that was the first day in that series. And then they held it over four days, which is the, which corresponds to the 14th day. So therefore that's pointing to Yashin Messiah. Uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, what's that chart called? The, uh, the dispensations, the ages and dispensations chart. You have uh, several ages there, seven ages and seven dispensations. Well, Yahshua Messiah didn't come in. He uh, he ushered his death, ushered in the fourth age, or he came out. Or, or well, his uh, he came in. He was born on the four thousand year. I'm sorry. Came into the world, manifested in flesh in the four thousand year through the loins of a virgin, and that corresponds to the fourth day, just as the sun was placed in the sky on the fourth day. So um, you got that there. And let me see what else was stood out there. Um, it was a, that, that chapter is pretty long, but those were, those were the main things I had highlighted uh, in that. And that's all I got to say. Okay, very good. All right, thank you, thank you for getting us kicked off. Who wants to go next? Um, I'll go ahead and share a little of what I saw. Um, okay. I'm reading through until verse 17. And what uh, what struck me real interesting was that uh, you shall observe, it was referred to as the feast of the unleavened bread. Okay, now unleavened bread, from what I understand, is bread that has not yet risen because it doesn't have the yeast factor in it mm -hmm. and uh, when the Messiah died on the cross he had not risen until 
after until the third day and uh not being risen until the third day and him claiming to be the bread of life i found that to be very interesting mm-hmm. yeah that's all i'm going to mm-hmm. share today thank you that's good very good we talked about that last night too very good awesome anybody else saw anything in the 12th chapter of exodus before we um break it down Sean, do you guys have anything? Oh, you know what? One more thing. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. The previous, the previous uh, man that uh, before me uh, brought to brought to mind of April or Abib being the first day or the first month of the Hebrew calendar, and uh, he also mentioned that this would be important. And in looking through unto uh, math or uh, Luke, okay, in Luke, the book talks about, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, or, I'm sorry, Luke uh, 1 and 26. And in the sixth month of the angel, the, and on the sixth month, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from Yahweh unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the angel's name and the virgin's name was Miriam. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. Yahweh is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Now, going down, we can look at, uh, we can look at, now, this was the sixth month of the, of the, of the Hebrew calendar, see? And the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar is, we got April, May, June, July, August, September. Okay, now, in, this, in, in, in the month of September, uh Miriam's cu- Miriam's sister was impregnated with with uh John So if we look at the Hebrew calendar from September October November December January February March April May June Okay, we're going to go to the end of September through to June. That is the ninth month. That is the ninth month of the pregnancy of Miriam. Now, if we go back, you know, this this is just this this is just mind boggling to me how it's in the sixth day of the year, in the sixth day of Moses' vision. Mankind was was brought up out of the dust of the earth. Now the world wants to say that, you know, their their Jesus was born on the twenty fifth of of December. But if we look at the at the true Hebrew calendar, Yahshua the Messiah was born June the sixth. See, and June is a is the month of fruition. According to the cycles of the seasons of this world, and when I first saw that, I was amazed at how it tied together. See, in mm-hmm. in, Corinth, in Corinthians, it talks about the Messiah being the second Adam. See, and Adam came in on the sixth day of of, uh, of creation, according to Moses' vision. That's that's one of the things that just kept me in class and kept me in class and wanting to learn more. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's uh, mm-hmm. that I'm going to, I'm going to quit for now because I know you guys got stuff to do too. So thank you for your time. Right. No problem. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else before I break this one down? I wanted to uh, point out something that Yahweh showed me. 
Okay. So everybody, the previous uh, speakers, they pretty much covered every about everything that I learned in chapter 12. But I also want to point out in 12 and 29, it says, and it came to pass that at midnight, Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the first burn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne into the first one of the captive that was in the dungeon. Now, um, that part, when it said um, they killed the firstborn all the way, you know, from Pharaoh, this whole time I thought Pharaoh was like a name. And I was just, you know, there was just one Pharaoh because um, I confused it with back then with Moses when he grew and from Pharaoh's daughter's household. And then he went and saw that Egyptian smite the Hebrew and he killed that uh, Egyptian and hit him in the sand. I'm thinking that this is the same. So that person, the Egyptian that Pharaoh, I'm sorry, not Pharaoh, but that Moses had um, slew back there. Um, that was a different Pharaoh. Um, that was that was uh, the king of Egypt during that period. And the Egyptian that he had killed back there was the firstborn of Pharaoh. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. right yep. and I'm so it, yep. mm -hmm. right so in 1229 where it says um and it came to pass that at midnight yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of egypt from the firstborn of pharaoh that's talking about it's, it's a different pharaoh and that's where i got confused because i'm thinking they all one person but uh that old pharaoh back there that he died off mm -hmm. all right so i just mm -hmm. i just want to mention that very good Thank you, Sean. Anybody else? All right. So let's break this chapter down. So I'll kind of bring it together what everybody was sharing. So the very first part of chapter 12, um, it says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of month. So this is when Yahweh is establishing the time with Israel. And so the beginning of month, it should be the first month of the year to you. And then the next chapter in the 13th chapter, it says that that month was Abiath, which corresponds to our April. So April is really the first month of the year, according to Yahweh. But of course, the world with the Gregorian calendar says that January is the first month of the year. And like um, it was said about Luke, we'll look at Luke in just a second about that. Um, that's what throws the whole world off. But you can actually prove by Exodus 12, chapter 13, chapter, and then Luke, the first chapter of what the Messiah's birthday is. And it's definitely not December. And we'll do that tonight. Um, and it says, speak unto the children of Israel that they should um, take out a lamb um, on the 10th day of April and hold it over for four days. And so what the first speaker was talking about, why that's so significant, um, when John the Baptist was baptizing everybody. He baptized the Messiah and the Messiah. Yahweh showed John who Yahshua was, that Yahshua was the Messiah. Then John identified him saying, behold, the lamb of Yahweh that take away the sins of the world. Right. And so Yahshua is being referred to as a lamb. And so just like in order for them to make it out, they had to have the blood of the lamb on the inside of their door and they had to eat the lamb and have the lamb inside of them in order to make it out. And so they had to take a lamb and take it out on the 10th day and hold it over to the 14th day. So I want to show y'all this real quick. I hope y'all can see the screen. Um, let's see. Can I pull the whiteboard up? I don't see the whiteboard on this particular Zoom thing. I had a whiteboard yesterday, but now I don't have one. Let's see. I may have to just pull it up on what's my All right, so let's look at the screen if you guys can. And for those of you who dialed in, um, I'll try to, you know, paint the picture as much as I can with my words. So if we're, like the first speaker talked about, zero has no value. We learned that in regular school, right? So if he takes it out on the 10th of April, then zero has no value at all. And so that's the first day. And he has to hold it over for four days, which was the 14th day, or you have day one through day four, basically. And so if you look at the ages and dispensations chart, and we go over into Peter, where Yash Yahweh said, a thousand years with Yahweh is like one day, and one day is a thousand years to Yahweh. And so we found out that Yahshua, from at the death of Adam, when Adam fell in the garden, when, uh, the transgression, 
from that point all the way to the Messiah was born was 4,000 years exactly. And so that means that if Adam is the first Adam and Yahshua is the second Adam, then Yahshua was held over for four days, right? And so from year 4,000 all the way to year zero, that's four days or 4,000 years. And 4,000 years is just one day. And so the lamb was truly held over for four days before he came in to die on the cross. Okay. And so that's what the first speaker was talking about when you had to hold the lamb over for, ten, for four days and then they had to kill the lamb. Another thing that the first speaker talked about in the fifth verse of Exodus, the 12th chapter, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. So they had to actually examine the lamb and it had to be without any spots or any blemish. Because the lamb is talking about Yahshua and the spots and blemishes are talking about the sin. And so when Yahshua went to John to be baptized, because at the time, the Jews had to go to John to be baptized and confess their sins. They had to confess that they were dead because the wages of sin is death. And so when they were confessing they were dead, what do you do with a dead man? You bury him. And so once they confess their sins, he had to bury them in the water or baptize them in the water. And they had to resurrect out of the water because they were being baptized into Yahshua's death. And so they confessed that they, so when Yahshua came to John to be baptized, Yahshua said, I don't have any sins. And John said, well, you coming to me? I have need to be coming to you and you coming to me to be baptized? And Yahshua said, permit it to be so now, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And so as he was actually put into the water and he came up out of the water, that's when, you know, so forth and so on. And he, you know, Yahweh spoke to him and said, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. And John realized and recognized that that was, Yahshua was the Messiah. Even though they were cousins, John didn't know that Yahshua was the Messiah. They didn't start calling Yahshua the Messiah until after um, he resurrected and poured out his Holy Spirit. They called him Yahshua, but they didn't know Yahshua was the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. They just didn't know who the Messiah was. And so, yes, they, they knew who Yahshua was, but they did not know that Yahshua was Messiah until Yahweh pointed it out to John. And John told them that he was the Lamb of Yahweh, but they didn't believe John. But anyway, um, and so um, he had to be held up. So it had to be without spot and without blemish. So if you go to Luke, like the other speaker was talking about, Luke, the 23rd chapter, I believe it's the 14th verse, when Yahshua, um, before he's actually crucified, he went to Pontius Pilate. They you know, handed him over to Pontius Pilate. 13th verse, he said, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of, and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. So he had to be examined. The lamb had to be examined, and there could not be any spots or any blemishes. And so that's why Pontius Pilate had to examine him and point out that there were no spots or blemishes or no faults with Yahshua because he's pointing to the lamb back there with um, the children of Israel. Another thing that I want to point out, because the world calls this, when Yahshua went um, right before he was crucified and ate, you know, um, the Passover with his disciples, his 12 disciples, and it was only those 12 that he ate with. When he ate the Passover with his 12 disciples, they called that, the, la the Lord's Supper. It was supposed to be the Last Supper. They call it the Lord's Supper. And the world still, to this day, um, in certain churches, they still participate in the Lord's Supper. But they don't pull out a lamb. They give you crackers and grape juice, which still, that should be something within itself. And they do it in the church. But I want to point out that they were supposed to take the blood of the lamb strike the top of the doorpost two sides to get from a base and give you four points of blood, but they also were supposed to do this in their house. So if you go to the 22nd chapter, um, 22nd verse of Exodus, uh -oh, 12 and 22, it says, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. 
So when the lamb is eaten, it's supposed to be eaten in your house. You're not supposed to eat it in the congregation or in the church or with a whole bunch of people. This is supposed to be something probably that you and your family do alone. And so the the church got it all messed up. And you could prove them wrong just by um, this particular chapter here. So many different things in this chapter that can kind of just dispel the whole Lord's Supper thing. But anyway, um, so those are a couple of things that we pointed out. Also, um, like Sean pointed out a minute ago about Pharaoh. Now, in the 29th verse that he was speaking about, another thing, too, in the 6th verse, it says, it talks about the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the two evenings. And the reason why that's important is because when Yahshua was crucified, it had to be Israel were the ones that had to crucify him. It couldn't be anybody else, even though Israel, the chief priest, was trying to get those other um, kings to actually crucify Yahshua, kill him. But they were like, I found no fault with him. Y'all see, y'all do it yourself. And so Israel had to be the ones to kill him because they had to be the ones to kill the lamb back there in Egypt. Um, let's see. And then 29th verse, which Sean was talking about, was Pharaoh. Um, I said, and it came to pass at midnight, Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. So, that being said, um, when you go all the way back to the second chapter of Exodus that we've already read, it talks about um, where Moses killed that Egyptian, right? So we go to the second chapter of Exodus. And um, when Moses was born, Pharaoh's daughter saw the um, child in the ark and things like that. And, um, you know, he grew up in Pharaoh's daughter's house. So this particular Pharaoh, he was the king at the time. Now, if you notice, there was also a Pharaoh back in Abraham's time when Pharaoh took Abraham's wife, Sarah to be his wife because he thought that that was his sister and Yahweh plagued Egypt for Sarah, his wife. And there was another time that um, when Joseph came down into Egypt and Pharaoh at that time had a dream and Joseph had to interpret his dream. So Pharaoh is not a name, it's a title for the king of Egypt. And so you had a, a lot of different Pharaohs but they all had names. You had Pharaoh, you know, King Ramses, the set first, the second. You had all the different Pharaohs that had different names. So this particular Pharaoh that was in Moses' time is a different Pharaoh that was in Joseph's time because it said, um, let's see, I think it's in the uh, second chapter, I think, of Exodus, where it talks about Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, or maybe the first chapter of Exodus. The Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, um, the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died off. Um, and so if you remember, 70 souls came down into Egypt, right? So 70 souls came down into Egypt of the children of Israel or of Jacob or Israel, him and his children and their wives and their children and things like that. So you had the 12 sons of Jacob and Joseph was one of them. Joseph was already in Egypt because his brother sold him down into Egypt. And so that was the only place where anybody in the whole world could get food. And so Joseph, because he interpreted Pharaoh's dream at that time, he's the reason why Egypt was so rich at the time. Because Yahweh had given him the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream and they stored up storehouses for seven years. And that was the only place in the world when Yahweh sent the famine out that anybody could get um, any food. And when they couldn't buy any, they had ran out of money. Then they sold their land. When they ran out of land, then they sold themselves as slaves. And so the whole seven years of famine, Egypt was extremely rich because of Joseph. And Joseph was made governor second to Pharaoh at that time. And after those 70 souls came down, you have to remember, Yahweh said they would be placed in bondage for 400 years. And so a lot of time passed, you know, and once the time passed, all of the sons of Jacob had already died. Moses' father wasn't even Levi. Moses' father was of the tribe of Levi. Levi was already dead. So Joseph and all his brothers and the Pharaoh that knew Joseph, that Joseph interpreted his dream, all of those people had already died off by the time you get to the second chapter of Exodus. 
And so the second chapter of Exodus talks about, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, of, a daughter of Levi. So that shows you that Moses is actually a Levite, which is important too when we keep going. So keep that in mind. He's of the tribe of Levi. And so when she had the child, whatever, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house. And so when Moses was out strolling and he saw an Egyptian um, smiting one of his Hebrew brethren. And so Moses rose up and he actually killed that Egyptian. Now, mind you, Moses um, was like Pharaoh's grand grandson because Pharaoh's daughter was Moses' mother, so to speak, because she raised Moses from being after he was weaned all up to this point. And Moses was 40 years old. So he was in her house for 40 years or 39 years, basically. And so he was like him to Pharaoh's grandson. And so when Moses killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand, the next day when he goes out strolling and he sees two Hebrews calling and the one that was in the wrong said, you're going to kill me like you did that Egyptian yesterday, Moses feared for his life. Now, if it was just any regular old Egyptian that he killed, then I'm sure Pharaoh wouldn't have had anything you know, he wouldn't have killed his so-called grandson, but it had to be somebody very important that Moses killed. So now, whenever a king dies or anything like that, his firstborn son takes the throne or takes his place, right? And so Pharaoh had sons and a daughter, of course, evidently. And so when Moses killed that Egyptian and he feared for his life and he ended up running to the land of Midian. So let's keep that in mind. So then after he goes to the land of Midian, in the third chapter of Exodus, Yahweh told Moses that all that sought his life. Now, mind you, he was only in the land of Midian for 40 years. And so not a whole bunch of bunch of time passed where a whole bunch of different kings were going to die off. And so Yahweh told Moses that all that sought your life in Egypt are dead. So the Pharaoh that wanted to kill Moses had died within that 40 year time span that Moses had left Egypt to go to Midian. And so if he died, that means his next of his next son had to take the throne. And so that means that the Pharaoh that was on the throne by the time Moses came back to Egypt and Yahweh plagued Egypt was the son of the Pharaoh that wanted to kill Moses. Why is that important? Because when Yahweh sent out that death decree, to kill all the firstborn of the Egyptians, firstborn sons of the Egyptians, if the Pharaoh that was on the throne at that time was the firstborn of the Pharaoh that wanted to kill Moses, then he would have been dead too. He evidently was the secondborn of the Pharaoh that wanted to kill Moses, and Moses evidently killed Pharaoh's oldest son when he killed the Egyptians and buried him in the sand, and that's why Pharaoh wanted to kill him. And so that's what Sean was trying to say when he was, you know, discussing about, you know, that particular Pharaoh when the death decree came and Yahweh killed all the male Hebrew, I mean, all the um, firstborn males of the household of the Egyptians and the beasts. The reason why that Pharaoh didn't die because he was the second born of the Pharaoh that was on the throne when Moses first fled Egypt for his life after he killed the Egyptians, if that made sense. And so that's what um, the three speakers were talking about. And so when we go to the 13th chapter of Exodus, this is where we're talking about where it's, um, does somebody have a question? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the 13th chapter, anybody got anything from 13th chapter? And we'll keep moving. We got a lot of ground to cover till we get to the 24th chapter. So I want to kind of, you know, let's move kind of quickly because there's a lot that we want to cover in the 24th chapter. I want to show you guys a couple of things that can really get rid of all the bull crap that some of these churches are talking about as far as the Sabbath day is concerned and the different things that we're supposed to be doing that we're not supposed to be doing. I'm going to show you guys a couple of those things. We won't get into the judgments and stuff, like the 21st, 22nd chapter, like those chapters. We won't do a lot of that. We'll point out a couple of things, but we'll miss, we'll kind of overlook some of those because it's a lot of um, judgments and things like that. But 13th chapter, anybody got anything for the 13th chapter that they saw? If you will, please, I'd like to go back to something you mentioned in the 12th about how okay. Moses, Moses' mother was Pharaoh's daughter? No, 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 no. Moses' mother was of the, tri the house of Levi. Moses' mother oh. was actually um, his father's aunt. <laughs> so Moses' mother and father were actually aunt and nephew of the tribe of Levi. I was saying oh, uh, she was told 
Pharaoh's daughter was told to speak Moses' mother because she raised Moses from being from from being a year old, being weaned up uh, until he was forty years old. So no, no. Oh, okay. Moses, I just I missed that. Yeah. when you when I when I heard that I said, wait a minute. I've never heard no, this no, no. before, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you neither. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good enough. <laughs> good enough. Right, cool. Yeah. It, it yeah, Moses, me. yeah. I'm sorry. So, so if anybody was, else thought it, I said that, no. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So it was it was Moses killed Pharaoh's oldest son. Yep. That's why Pharaoh okay. wanted to kill him. Oh, okay. I, yeah, because I I was wondered why why the Pharaoh would want to kill Moses. You know. I mean, I know he killed an Egyptian and buried him, but who was this guy? Now I know. <laughs> yep, it was his oldest son. That's why the Pharaoh okay. that was on the throne afterwards didn't die in the the um when the death angel passed because he was not a firstborn. He got the throne uh, because his oldest brother was dead already. Oh, okay, okay, good enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Absolutely. Any other questions from the twelfth chapter before we move to the thirteenth? Yes, Carl, I have a question. Are you saying that um, that Egyptian that was killed, um, that was um, the pharaoh's son? Yes. Um, First born. Because I, I know that is taught. Is that in the book, though? Um, well, that's how you prove it by the book. Um, why else would the pharaoh that was on the... Um, Throne, why did he not die in the death decree if he was the first one son? Yeah. And, and matter of fact, Dr. Kinley actually explained it a lot more in the, um, there's a transfer that I can email you where Dr. Kinley went through it um, a lot more. It's called Aaron's Rod and oh man, I can't remember the whole name of it, but um, I can email you that transcript too. It may be on our website, but let me see. And that will be, um, he kind of goes into more detail about it as well. Yeah, I'd like to read oh, that. Um, I'd appreciate mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. I've heard it. I've heard it. But this I, um, is, is it right? This is the. I, I you wanted, see the screen. This, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why I mentioned that is because, you know, um, I remember saying something. I know the uh, founder. Uh, it, anyway, it was taught in the school with that lamb where when that lamb was pierced in the side, you know, and we go to Yahshua and we show how that he was pierced in the side. And then I was called and I, I repeated that. And um, I was called out on it. Now, it doesn't say in the 12th chapter, it doesn't say that in the book, that the lamb right. was passed in the side. But it's mm -hmm. by vision and revelation uh, that we know that that is so. And so that was right. my reason why I mentioned about this mm -hmm. here with Pharaoh's son, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Egyptian. Well. You can prove that the lamb was pierced in the side, even though it doesn't say it here. And the right. way we prove it is when Yahshua <laughs> said he fulfilled, he had to fulfill everything that was written in the law of the prophets. And so if you don't right. take it on this side, you take it on the other. For example, this is another example. Right. The book doesn't say either that there was a death decree on all male Hebrew children from two-year-old down to birth with Moses. It doesn't say that. We teach that, but it doesn't say that. But how do we know that that was the case then? Because when Yahshua was born, let's see, let me find it. It's in Matthew, um, Herod, let's see, uh, where was it, two year, uh, two year down to birth, let's see, two year, let me find it in Matthew real quick so I can read it for you. I don't want to misquote it. Where is it? Um. Where is it where, Vanessa, you, you, you got it pretty quick. Where is it where Herod sent out the death decree for um, Yahshua? Was trying to kill all the Hebrew children. The male Hebrew children to destroy, to destroy him. 
Let's see. His grandfather was a I feel. Here we go, right here, 216. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, just like when Pharaoh saw that he was mocked of the uh, Hebrew midwives, shipper and pure. Remember that? So Pharaoh, mm-hmm. I mean, Herod saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had the, the li- diligently inquired of the wise men. And so, in the like, that's the fulfillment of it. And so that's when Moses, in the first, cha- no, second chapter of Exodus, second chapter of Exodus, when Pharaoh um, sent out the death decree to kill all the male Hebrew children from, um, I say two years down, down the road, but it doesn't read that way. Now, the reason why we know that is because when you go over to Exodus, I believe it is the eighth chapter or the sixth or seventh or sixth chapter, I believe it is, it talks about the age of Moses and Aaron when they go to Pharaoh. Aaron was 83 years old. Moses was 80 years old. So Aaron and Moses are three years apart. That's the reason why you don't read right. that Aaron had to be hid because Aaron had just missed the death decree because he was three years old and the death decree was from two-year-old down to birth. Another mm-hmm. point that you can actually, mm-hmm. another point you can actually make too, in the same way that it doesn't say um, in one part, where was it? Oh crap! Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? With um, David and Israel, numbered. Oh, I would say numbered. Where is it? Uh, he numbered Israel in in Chronicles and in Samuel. Here we go. Kings, where was it? Let me find it real quick just to show you what I'm talking about. It may not read so to speak one way, but it'll, it'll read the other way. So I think it's, you know, with the people. Yep, here we go. 24th chapter of Second Samuel. Let's see. So in the 24th chapter of Second Samuel, it says, And again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he, Yahweh, moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Because Yahweh was pissed off at Israel. And so Yahweh moved David to number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain, blah, blah, blah. So it said that Yahweh met Israel. So Yahweh moved David to go against Israel. But then mm. when you go to Second Chronicles, 21st chapter, in the very first verse, it says, and Satan, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab mm-hmm. the same thing that said in Kings. And so one part says that Yahweh moved David to number Israel. And then another part, the same incident, it said Satan stood against, up against Israel and pro, Satan provoked David to number Israel. So which one is it? It's both. You know what I mean? So right. even though it may not read one way, but so... As far as the lamb goes, the way the reason why we know that the lamb was pierced in the side because yeah, Adam was uh, the one was taken out of Adam's side, and Adam represented Yahshua. The ark mm-hmm. represents Yahshua, where the ark had the door in the side. You know what I mean? And so many other um, mm-hmm. things that you can actually. So the lamb had to be pierced in the side, and so if it doesn't mm-hmm. say it specifically in one part, you can always catch it in the fulfillment. And if you can catch it in the fulfillment, you can catch it in the institution. And so, so forth and so on. Just like mm-hmm. um, one part of it, where, where, where is it? Oh, with, when, when Joshua, um, the son of Nun, when he numbered the 144,000, mm-hmm. it said over there in Joshua that he didn't, number, he didn't number them. But over in Revelations, it said, and this was the number that he numbered them was 144,000. Right. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say that in Joshua, though. But John saw the vision and revelation and yeah. he heard the number, even though it wasn't written down what the number was. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. the way that Dr. Kim actually goes through and explains how it was known that that was Pharaoh's son that was killed, that Moses killed or whatever. Um, and that was it. So and then another thing that he talked about there, too, the reason why Moses even killed that Egyptian is because. The, the the Israelite or the the Jew that the Egyptian was actually smiting was Moses's brother Aaron. Like what? How do you know that? What are you talking about? How can you prove that? 
how can you prove it was Aaron that the Egyptian was smiting? Because Moses fled with the rod. And so when Moses came, when Yahweh asked Moses at the burning bush, you know, what do you have in your hand? He said, a rod. He threw the rod on the ground, turned to a serpent, da, 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 came back down to Egypt. It was called Aaron's rod. Because if you remember right. in, in Genesis, all of the firstborn of the tribe, they were supposed to be the ones that had the staff or the rod. And so Aaron yeah. being the firstborn son, Aaron had the rod, but Moses took Aaron's rod and smote the Egyptian with Aaron's rod and fled with the rod. And so that's why Moses had Aaron's rod the whole time until he came back down into Egypt. And what that's talking about too, Cain took Abel's rod and smote Abel with his own rod because Abel was a shepherd of the sheep. And so Cain took Aaron's. Mm. And so he talks about all of that in the transcript. And here it is on our website. So if you go to the website, soulfood.org, and click on chat lectures and pamphlets and click on the transcript, it's going to be um, the second transcript that says First National Convention, Exodus, and Aaron's Rod. He goes into detail about um, all of that, too. So it's a really good transcript to read. Like, it's really eye-opening. Um, and so um, that one kind of explains it in more detail, if that helps. Okay. I, yeah, I sure mm -hmm. would like that one. Mm -hmm. It's really good. I loved it. It's really good. Very good. Okay. Um, oh man, it's so much with that rod. Yeah, that's too, good. First time nice. rod. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a lot with that rod too. Um, even with Ephraim and Manasseh and with Yahshua, the son of Nun, having to be attached to the tribe of Ephraim instead of, like, it's a lot. That's why he's called Yahshua, the son of Nun. It was, it's a lot. But anyway, so stick to the mm. script. Okay. So the 13th chapter of Exodus. Um, anybody got anything from the 13th chapter? Nope. Okay. Um, this is where Yahweh told um, Moses to thank, tell the um, children of Israel, sanctify me all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the matrix. Now, I used to be confused about this part. I didn't know what that meant. Um, where it says, sanctify me um, all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, remember this day in which ye came out of out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Let me put it on the screen, I'm sorry. Out of the house of bondage, Exodus 13. For by strength and hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came you out in the month Abib. And so this shows that the first month of the year to them is April, or Abib, of course, my fire, April. And what they were talking about with the Messiah's birthday, we'll touch that really quickly, um, just so we'll have it. Since we mentioned it, we'll touch it. So Luke, the first chapter, going to the 26th verse. So if you look read the first through the 26th verse, it talks about how the um, Archangel Gabriel, and this is Luke writing to Theophilus, all the accounts that he learned about um, what happened back there with the Messiah and things like that. So in, um, there were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, um, the priest Zechariah of the course of Avia, and his wife was the, of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So Zechariah was one of the priests that officiated in the tabernacle. So he also was of the tribe of Levi. And the reason why we know they both had to be of the tribe of Levi because the, the children of Israel had to marry within their tribe not to split up their inheritance. And so somebody from the tribe of Judah could not marry somebody of the tribe of Levi. They had to keep it within their tribe because of inheritance sake. So um, Elizabeth and Zechariah were Levites of, of the priesthood. And so that's John the Baptist's parents. So John the Baptist was a Levite or one um, of the priesthood that was very important because Moses also was of the house of Levi. And of course, John the Baptist had to point out who Yahshua the Messiah was, just like Moses had to point out who Yahshua the son of Nun was. So that's very important that they both were Levites. And in the 10th chapter mm -hmm. of 1 Corinthians, it talks about that um, the children of Israel they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Mm -hmm. So when we keep reading mm -hmm. in the 14th chapter of Exodus, which we're going to read, the young man, Yahshua, the son of Nun, he was 30 years old when they came up out of Egypt. And he also went through the cloud 
in the sea and was baptized unto Moses too at the age of 30 years old. And so Yahshua fulfilling that also had to be 30 years old when he went to John the Levite to be baptized mm-hmm. with the children of Israel too. And so all of it ties together. That's why Moses had to be of the tribe of Levi. John had to be of the tribe of Levi too. But Elizabeth and Miriam were cousins too, though. And so even though they were cousins, John did not know that Yahshua was the Messiah, though. He knew him. He knew that he was Yahshua, but he didn't know that Yahshua was the Messiah. Just like Moses didn't know that Yahshua, the son of Nun, was the angel that Yahweh told him he would send before him. But anyway. So when we're talking about the birth date. And so Elizabeth and Zechariah, Elizabeth was barren. She couldn't have any children. Um, they were of age at the time. They were well stricken in years, just like Abraham and Sarah. And the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah when he was actually doing the incense in the tabernacle of the hour of prayer like he was supposed to. And so evidently he was praying for a son or for a child. And it said that, you know, your prayers have been answered. And so... Um, the angel came unto him and told him that he would have a son and he would call his name in the Bible. It says John, but we know that it, there was no J. And so it was actually um, John or Elias, however um, it is in Hebrew. And then um, so Zechariah was like, how can I have a child saying that we're old? And he said, because you didn't believe, then you're going to be, str- you won't be able to speak. You're going to be dumb and you won't be able to speak until this thing is fulfilled. And so um, Elizabeth got pregnant, and it said that John the Baptist would be born with the Holy Spirit, and he would have the spirit and power. He would come and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, which is a whole bunch of other stuff that we could talk about that. We don't have time. And so then when you go down here, um, so Elizabeth was pregnant. So it says, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. Saying, thus hath Yahweh dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from Elohim unto a city of Galilee. So if it's the sixth month, then in April's the first month, then the sixth month has to be September. So in September is when the angel came to, to a virgin is found to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Miriam or Mary. And so this is when Yahshua um, was put in the Virgin Mary's womb. And so that was in September. And so when it talks about that in Galatians, the fourth chapter, fourth verse, that in the fullness of time, that means she went full term, the whole nine months. So if you count from September, Nine months from September is June. But even if we said that this was a six month, according to the Gregorian calendar, June, you, nine months from June is not December. It is utterly impossible for his birth date to have been in December, no matter what right. calendar you use at all to calculate his birthday from using the book of Luke. It's impossible. Now, if you go back and look at Elizabeth when she was five months old, um, and then in the sixth month, September, if you now John the Baptist, he was born in December. Because she was five months pregnant. And then when you count from five months pregnant, then from September, October, November, December, four more months. Now he was born in December. But Yahshua was born in June. And you use the 12th and 13th chapter of Exodus to prove Yahshua's birth date and then the first chapter of Luke. And it talks about that. So um, that's when she conceived in the month of September and so forth and so on. So that's going to take us back to the 13th chapter of Exodus. Hope that's making sense. Um, anything else in 13th chapter of Exodus? Okay. So when it talks about redeeming the firstborn. Um, so it says, let's see. We'll go to the 11th verse of the 13th chapter, 13 and 11. And it shall be when Yahweh shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto Yahweh all that openeth the matrix. 
I was like, what does that mean? And every firstling that cometh of a beast, which thou hast, the males shall be Yahweh's. And every firstling of an ass, thou shalt redeem with the lamb. And so redeem, if you look at the word redeem, like I was saying last night, like say for instance, um, you know, my husband gets in trouble or whatever, and he has to, you know, pay a fine. Once I pay that fine, he's redeemed of that, that um, whatever he was charged with, he's redeemed now. So he's, you know, been taken care of. Something actually took the place of, so he can actually be redeemed from whatever um, he was supposed to be bound to do. And so what Yahweh said, because he took all the firstborn males in Egypt of man and beast, but the children of Israel, they didn't have to, it, they, it passed over them. But they still have to give the first of their flock, their crops, and their children unto Yahweh. But so it's saying now, um, every first thing of an ass, thou shalt redeem with the lamb. So instead of offering up the first um, born of an of ass or a donkey, he'd rather have a lamb instead. So offer up a lamb instead of a donkey. And it said, um, and if thou will not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among the children shall thou redeem. So the children, they were not supposed to kill their children. They were supposed to redeem their children um, by offering up a lamb instead of their children. And so that's what it means by where their children shall be redeemed. And so they're not going to kill their children, but they're going to redeem their children with a lamb to offer up unto Yahweh instead of the life of their child. Um, and there's a whole other reason why they have to do all that, too. Um, also in the 13th chapter, um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So 15th verse, and it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahweh slew all firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to Yahweh all that opened at the matrix being male, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for a frontlet between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahweh brought us forth out of Egypt. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Yahweh led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For Yahweh said, let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But Yahweh led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him and he had straight for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel saying Elohim will surely visit you what do you mean visit him, them and he did visit them in the body of Yahashua anyway and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you now at the time that Joseph said this they weren't even in bondage yet but he said that Elohim will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And Yahweh went before them. This is part is important. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Keep this in mind when we get to the 24th chapter of Exodus. Now, Yahweh went before them in a pillar of a cloud. So the cloud in the daytime was a cloud, but at night it turned into a pillar of fire so they could still have light as they were being laid. So keep that in mind when we keep reading. Um, and then that's the 13th chapter. So when we get to the 14th chapter, does anybody have anything they want to share in the 14th chapter or that they saw? <laughs> Looks like y'all are getting something out of this tonight. Good. Um, oh. Um, what? Go ahead. I just had a little summary for the chapter 14. Okay. All right. So that was when they were getting ready to flee out of Egypt. So um, Yahweh told Moses he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart and then that, you know, they should follow them. The Egyptians should follow them or whatever. And then, you know, that's when Pharaoh readies up his uh, people and care chariot and all that stuff and he took 600 chosen chariots all of the chariots of egypt and captains over every one of them so mm -hmm. um when the children and then that was when you know uh the children saw the egyptians they 
cried out unto Yahweh, you know, they lost faith and, you know, they went to Moses and was like, has thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Pretty much saying that it had been better to serve the Egyptians than to be brought out of Egypt only to die in the wilderness. So mm-hmm. that's what Moses uh, told them told them to like not be scared and to stand still and like you know see salvation of Yahweh which he will show today and they would mm-hmm. not see the Egyptians after today so you know that that's just Moses saying like you know have faith in Yahweh and like he'll show mm-hmm. you so um mm-hmm. Moses was saying that Yahweh will fight for them and hold peace and uh, mm-hmm. that's what Yahweh told Moses to tell the children of Israel to keep going, like move forward. And then um, Yahweh told Moses to take his rod and stretch out the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel should go walk on dry ground through the mid sea. And Yahweh told Moses to stretch out thine hand over the sea and have the waters come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. And when he did, and when he did that, the Egyptians fled against it, and Yahweh overthrew Egyptians in the mid sea. But the children of Israel walked upon dry ground, and it was like it's it just blew me away because, like you know, it really had been, and it's mm-hmm. really crazy. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. that's all. I had. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Awesome. Good job. Very good. Now about that. So she talked about. She read about the um, horsemen, right? So how many chariots was it? It was 600. Okay, got uh, 600. Uh, so it was, uh, I got that. 600. I, I have this sinus thing going on. <clears throat> there were, mm-hmm. uh, in 23rd verse, <clears throat> it says that, and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, Mm-hmm. His chariots and horsemen, but over on the uh, on the seventh verse, it said, and he took six hundred chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. So you had mm-hmm. the six hundred chariots, <clears throat> you had the six hundred <clears throat> horses, and the six hundred horsemen. And mm-hmm. y'all <clears throat> showed us that that that's. I can't even say it. That's that adversary, 666. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and he t- said it, they took, a, Yahweh took off their chariot wheels and Israel, of course, went through on dry ground, <clears throat> dry ground. But after that, then the Egyptians tried to come in and <clears throat> pursuing after them. But the same rod that Moses held up to to, uh, to divide the waters of the Red Sea is the same rod he used <clears throat> to bring down the waters on the Egyptians. And so that, you know, people say, well, uh, and, you know, in this Cecil B. DeMille, it shows Pharaoh going back down, <clears throat> putting his son <clears throat> in Moloch's arm. No such animal. Mm-hmm. Said, mm-hmm. And, then, mm-hmm. and Yahweh over, <clears throat> and Moses stretched forth the 27th verse. <clears throat> And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it. And Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. <clears throat> so the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remain, <clears throat> there remain not so much as one of them. So that includes Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. He didn't. Mm-hmm. He did not. <clears throat> he did not go back down. <clears throat> he did not go back down into Egypt. So Yahweh mm-hmm. said that the Egyptians that you see today, you won't see again forever. He meant just. That. <clears throat> he meant just that. So, like the mm-hmm. young lady was saying, it shows that if you have faith in Yahweh, anything that can overtake you, Yahweh <clears throat> is the one <clears throat> that will take care of that matter. So, no, um, no one at any time, anywhere <clears throat> is getting away with anything. 
when it is time for mm-hmm. Yahweh to 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 lay hand on him, Yahweh will lay hand because Pharaoh said he because Pharaoh said when he was in Egypt, who is Yahweh? <clears throat> I don't know Yahweh, neither will I let you go. Okay, then. I'm glad you said it that way. I'm on Yahweh going to show you who who he is. Mm -hmm. You want to know who this Yahweh is? He is the uh, Elohim of heaven and earth. And if he has chosen Mm -hmm. you out of this world to give you a revelation or give you this gift to, ain't nothing can keep you for because Israel on their way out from bondage. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't when it was time for them to come out, there was nothing that could to impede or delay that process. <clears throat> so mm, y'all have excuse me. Oh, throat is killing me. Uh, but <clears throat> that was one of the things that actually uh <clears throat> oh and on the what's that? The oh, where am I? My patient went over. That's the wrong one. <laughs> That's all. <clears throat> that well, that's what basically <clears throat> stuck stuck out in, in in my head was that six six six. Yahweh showing it all the way down. <clears throat> that even with Pharaoh, he was that beast, a representative of that beast man of sin. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Y'all forgive me. Mm-hmm. All good. All right, and then um, another thing too. We we'll go back to the 12th chapter of Exodus where it talks about they had to kill the lamb in between the two evenings. And we know that that was on mm-hmm. um, the 15th of April because they had to take it out from the 10th, hold it over to the 14th, and kill the lamb between the two evenings. So between the 14th and 15th. And then it said at midnight, um, Yahweh passed through and smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And they, um, you know, they told them to get up out of there, like super duper late. Um, between the two, you know, between midnight and daytime, whatever. And so that was one day after the man was killed. Then um, you have another, when they were out there, you know, going to and through the Red Sea, that was the next day. And then the Egyptians came and it said that Yahweh caused the east wind to dry the ground overnight. That's another day. And then on the third day is when they actually resurrected to, through the Red Sea into the wilderness. So you have three days after the death of the lamb that they actually resurrected into the wilderness, which proves, you know, Yahshua was dead and he was buried and he rose the third day. So Israel, being a type, had to resurrect into the land of Midian or in the wilderness after the death of that lamb. Um, So, yeah, that part um, stood out to me, too, even though it doesn't say it specifically. But, you know, you kind of pick up the time frame. Um, also in the 14th chapter of Exodus. Well, no. Does anybody else have anything in the 14th chapter before I do all I'm going to do? Sorry. We got time. I just want to make a quick little point. Something that I noticed. Um, he said, well, when he parted the Red Sea, it was an east wind that blew all that night. And um, if, if you pay attention to, you know, when you're reading, Every, something, you know, he deals with the east quite a bit. The sun rises in the mm-hmm. east and sets in the west. He also had placed an angel when he when he uh, uh, kicked Adam and Eve out, or Adam out of the garden, and Eve out and Eve followed. He placed an angel at the east. Mm-hmm. And then even when he was uh, born uh, through the loins of a virgin, it was a star <laughs> in the east. So, you know, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of significance uh, mm-hmm. with, with when, you know, with those principles when you follow it on down, you know, down, you know, line it up and follow it on down through the law and the prophets and whatnot. And that's all I got. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the man was placed eastward in the garden. Adam was placed eastward in the garden. Um, so that's why Yahshua's star had to be in the east because he had to fulfill Adam being placed eastward in the garden. So very good. Awesome. Very good. And so um, if we look at the 19th verse of um, Exodus 14 and 19, um, I could just scroll. And the angel of Yahweh, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. 
The angel of Yahweh, which we'll point out later on as we keep reading, was Yahshua, the son of Nun. Because if we, once we keep reading, whenever Yahshua will go into the tent to speak with Moses and Aaron, the cloud will come and sit um, above the tent. And so the cloud was actually going along with Yahshua. Yahshua was the angel that Yahweh said he was sent. So when the angel of Yahweh, which went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, then the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them also. So Yahshua was the angel. And it said, and it came, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these. And so it was a cloud of darkness to the Egyptians, and it was um, light to the by night to these um, that were the children of Israel. And so the same gospel to the world is darkness or is ignorant, like they don't they don't see it, they can't see it. No matter how you try to give it to them, they just cannot see it. But then for those of us who are the sons of Yahweh, it's light unto us, especially in these dark times. So that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back, blah, 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 blah. 24th verse, and it came to pass that in the morning watch, had to be in the morning, um, Yahweh looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. It was so early in the morning that the sun had not risen yet. Because in, when we keep reading about the tabernacle, the high priest had to snuff out the candlestick at six o'clock in the morning, and then the sun would come in and light the tabernacle. The tabernacle was never in darkness. So at three o'clock in the afternoon, the high priest had to light the candlestick so that whenever the sun went down, the, tab the tabernacle was never in darkness. And so even though it was early in the morning, it was so early that you still had the pillar of cloud, I mean, the pillar of fire. Um, was still there because it still wasn't light yet. Why is that important? So this is when Yahweh tore off the Egyptians, uh, you know, chariot wheels and things like that. And Yahweh said, the Moses stretched out their hand, let the waters go back on the um, Egyptians. The Moses stretched out his hand, and the waters returned, covered the da 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 da. But the children of Israel walked up on dry ground. So they had to resurrect early in the morning. Is my point? Because when Yahshua rose up on that third day, it was early in the morning. And so the children of Israel had to resurrect into the wilderness early in the morning because Yahshua had to fulfill these things. And so that stood out to me. Um, that, you know, everybody else kind of brought out some of the other obvious points too. But the last verse of the 14th chapter is the whole reason why Yahweh took them to and through the way that he took them because he could have taken them by the way of the Philistines because it was quicker, but he took them this way. And the 31st verse says, and Israel saw that great work which Yahweh did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared Yahweh and believed Yahweh and his servant Moses. So all that was done in order for them to believe Yahweh, fear Yahweh, and his servant Moses. All right, 15th chapter. Oh, that's right around the surface. Hurry up. Hello. Yes, Hello. Mm -hmm. yes ma'am. Um, may I say something, please? Ab absolutely. Yes. I um I was looking at um I think it's verse 17 where it said that they brought they took the 600 chariots 600 horses and 600 men um that would be mm -hmm. like 666 but then it also said um and all the chariots of Egypt so I was thinking that it seemed as if the whole army came, don't know if I'm right, but to me, it would be like Egypt would have lost its power if its whole army was drowned in the sea. Because in, is it 17, it mentioned the 600 horses, 600 oh. men. And it Let's said see. captains over every one of them, but it also said, and all the, is it 16? Chariots it's 17. Of, it's 14 17. and 17. 14 yes. and 7. I'm sorry. 14, 14 and 7. 7. 
and he took 600 chosen chariots yes. <laughs> and, and all the chariots of Egypt yes. and captains over every one of them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it's so if it was not just the 600 alone, because if he took all then they would have been left real devastated, no power in Egypt now because their army would have been drowned in the sea. So I was just looking, you know, at that. Mm-hmm. Right, so know. the 17th verse, like you were saying, it says, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians yes. and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and of all his hosts upon his chariots and upon his horse and so the 600 chariots horse and all that but also the rest of his army he had more than right. the, the horses he had the other arm the, the rest of his army too so yes mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. just wanted to share yep. that absolutely thank you for sharing you welcome all right cool 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 anything else in the 14th chapter before we go to 15 This is like, this part, like 15th chapter kind of, it's like, you know what, these people get on my nerves, but we do too. We're the same way. We can't really point the finger at them because this one's like, what in the world? These people are crazy. But it had to be for all these things were done because they were talking about the Messiah. So the Messiah actually fulfilled it. So, you know, once you have an understanding, it's not, it don't piss you off as much as it normally would. But anyway, all right, 15th chapter of Exodus. Anybody want to share what they saw in the 15th chapter? Because we got to move with haste. I want to say one thing that I, uh, I saw in the 15th chapter. So um, towards the end of it, um, when, uh, when Moses had brought Israel from the Red Sea, and when they went to the wilderness of Shur, they went three days into the wilderness, and then they found no water. And then when they went to uh, Mara, if I'm pronouncing it right, um, they couldn't drink of that water because it was bitter. And then the people, they were mo- murmuring to, against Moses saying, you know, what shall we drink? And then that's when Yahweh, he uh, showed them the tree and then cast it down to the waters and made the water sweet. And like similar to the last chapter, when the children of Israel, you know, after or when they saw those Egyptians coming after them, they was like, oh, you know, it, you brought us out of the, you know, the land of Egypt to just to die and whatnot. And I think in the next chapter, too, they do the same thing again. Um, they was like, you know, they just kept murmuring, but, you know, they were doing it to Moses, not knowing that the whole time is, is they're murmuring against Yahweh. Yeah, and I forgot where it says that, but I think it's the next chapter. But, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. You know, you would think, you know, after all these, the powers that, you know, Yahweh shows and does is killing the Egyptians and, you know, in this chapter with the waters and so on and so forth, you would think they were, you know, they'll have some more faith in Yahweh, but, you know, like you said, it's just how it's meant to be. Yeah. Now, if we look at the first chap- first verse of the 15th chapter, <clears throat> thank you for pointing that out. Um, the first verse of the 15th chapter, they start singing, you know, uh, Moses starts singing songs, <coughs> and Israel starts singing songs, Moses' sister, Miriam, she got the tambourines and stuff, and they're all singing songs unto Yahweh. Yahweh is so great. This is what he did to them. He's mighty. Right. Oh, my goodness. Blah, blah, right. blah. And then when you go, it's only three freaking days. Three days. And they <laughs> forgot that fast what Yahweh had done for them. So when you go yeah. down, and I'll point out how Yahshua actually fulfilled that, Sean. Um, so the 22nd verse. And so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried and Moses cried unto Yahweh and Yahweh showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of Yahweh, thy Elohim, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh that healeth thee. Now, when you look at the water that was bitter, 
and how Yahshua fulfilled it. So remember, um, in three days, you know, we got the whole three days thing. So the prophetic time, one day, um, with Yahweh is like a um, one year. It's corresponding to one year because we fought, picked that up in Numbers where when they spied out the land and they didn't do what Yahweh said, they spied it out for 40 days and Yahweh said, I'm going to give you a day for a year. So they had to be in the wilderness for 40 years. And so three has no value. So after all of that, so three days later, after they resurrect out of the, you know, rest, after they were baptized and all the stuff like that. So then you have another three principle where when Yahshua was 30 years old again, three, zero has no value, he had to go to Jonah to be baptized. Now, before Yahshua went to Jonah to be baptized, all of those other Jews were having to confess their sins and be dumped in the water. And that made the water so-called bitter to drink because all of their sins and their transgressions, he buried them in the water. But when Yahshua came, being the tree of life, and when he was put in, that tree of life was put in the water, and he fulfilled water baptism, now the water is sweet to drink now, because he has come in to fulfill it. And so that's how Yahshua fulfilled this back there with the children of Israel, with the waters of Mara. When his body or the tree of life was put in the water, now it's sweet to drink now because it was bitter from all of those Jews that were being baptized because of the sins that they had committed. So that's how Yahshua fulfilled that um, in the 15th chapter of Exodus, verses 22 down to 25. Um, anybody else got anything else in the 15th chapter of Exodus so we can keep moving? Uh, just, uh, uh, <clears throat> just, uh, just one thing, uh -uh, but I, I mm -hmm. guess it's just reiterating what you are already said, but <clears throat> how they were so... Um, Oh, we're going to sing all these songs to Yahweh and Yahweh is my strength and my song. And he, 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 he killed Pharaoh's, he, uh, Pharaoh's chariots and his host have he cast into the sea. And they had all these admirations and admirations and I trust Yahweh and the enemy. And then just over, like I said, just three days and you mm -hmm. can't. <clears throat> And we, we do the same thing. I hope it's a lot less now. Um, but we might need to be mindful of this. Because <clears throat> it looks like when they, when they, <clears throat> when they, when Yahweh was saving them out of their affliction, they want to sing. But where is it that says, does not Yahweh bring up evil upon you too? So these are tests and trials to see, <coughs> mm, to see if you will believe and trust in Yahweh. This is where your uh, faith is established to see if when persecution come, when persecution arise <coughs> because of the word, are you going to be able, <coughs> are you going to be able to stand or are you going to fold? Ooh. You know, and that was something I looked at when, when I read it. I said, gosh, just, I mean, just no time. And you got all these, and mirac oh, thou art full of mercy, and yada, yada, yada. And then three days, look, we thirsty. We need some water. After he's brought you through <clears throat> the Red Sea, killed off the Egyptians. First of all, plagued Egypt, <clears throat> 10 devastating plagues. You only felt three of the ten, brought you out by a mighty hand, killed Pharaoh and his host that came after you, and then you sing all these songs, and then before you can before you, before you can finish singing a song. Look, I'm thirsty. I need some water. Mm -hmm. We need some, we need some water. You mm -hmm. brought us, <clears throat> you know, brought us out here to die. Mm -hmm. I said, and my host told him, look, who am I that you murmur against? I don't know if it's in this chapter or not. But you don't who who are you murmuring? You murm you're not murmuring against me. You're murmuring mm -hmm. against Yahweh. And that's what I'm saying. We need to be mindful because Yahweh talked about those complainers. Just always, ah yeah, I don't have this and I need that and I don't have <laughs> excuse me, y'all. Mm. But let us be mindful. We don't want to be Yahweh said he gave us this Israel <clears throat> as an example. So we would not err. Or make the errors, <clears throat> or make the mistakes that they did. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, but it's the seventh verse of the next this chapter that we're going to be that um Moses said that. So we're going to touch that too real quick because we're kind of running out of time. Um, so 16th chapter, first verse it says, and they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, mm-hmm. which is between Elam and Sinai. Um, so before they got to um, Mount Sinai, they were actually between Elam and Sinai in the land of the wilderness of Sin. On the 15th day of the second month, which was May, so May 15th, 30 days after they consumed that lamb, right, after the right. departing <clears throat> out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, What to Elohim? We had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pot and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill us. This whole congregation or this whole assembly was hungry. Now you're hungry. Now, now you got the nerve to say you were better in Egypt okay. eating flesh pot and eating bread, but you was getting your brains beat out though and crying about okay. your head hurting because you got hit upside the head. But you're better <laughs> off in Egypt though. You just ate a lamb 30 days ago. You didn't think to kill one of them lamb and eat one of them lamb again? Complaining about everything. Won't get up and do it themselves. Mm-hmm. Want to claim we waiting on Yahweh and then complain when he's going to do it in our time. But anyway, we won't have time to go through that. So then, then said Yahweh unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. This is the important part that I wanted to show you. Then said Yahweh unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So this is just to prove them. And it shall come right. to pass that on the sixth <clears throat> day they shall prepare that which they bring in and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So they're supposed to gather the um, bread every day. But on the sixth day, they have to uh, get a, a double portion or twice as much on the sixth day. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, and even then you shall know that Yahweh has brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of Yahweh, for that he heareth your murmurings against Yahweh. And what are we that you murmur against us? Mm-hmm. You are murmuring and complaining against Yahweh. You, it may look like it's somebody else's fault while you're going through whatever you're going through. It may look like we ain't got time. I ain't gonna preach about it. Let me keep going. And Moses said, "This shall be when Yahweh shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that Yahweh hears your murmurings, which ye murmur against Him. And what are we?" Your murmurings are not against us, but against Yahweh. And Moses spake unto, the, unto Aaron, say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before Yahweh, for he hath heard your murmurings. And so it came to pass, and it came, um, toward, looked toward the wilderness, behold, the Lord of Yahweh appeared in the clouds, and Yahweh spake to Moses, saying, I heard the murmuring claim of the children of Israel, speaking of them, saying, at even you shall eat flesh, in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you should know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up <laughs> and covered the camp. In the morning, the dew lay around about the host. So Yahweh gave them quails and he gave them bread, right? This is in the institution. Now, quails are birds, okay? Mm-hmm. Birds that fly. Now, in the fulfillment of this, remember there was two different instances where the people were hungry and mm-hmm. Yahshua had compassion on them, and he fed yeah. them with two fish, fish and five bread. loaves of bread the first bread. time, and then two fish and seven loaves of bread the second time. That's five true. and seven equals 12. So mm-hmm. you have 12 loaves of bread total and two little fish each time. Now, the reason why it was fish in the fulfillment and not quail like in the institution, because at the time that this was done, they had not been given a law yet. They were not bound to any law. So the birds, mm-hmm. they fly free. The birds are free to fly. Fish are it's like just, birds, but they're lake bound and they cannot, they are bound to the lake, even though they have fins and they look like they're flying when they're flapping their 
their fins, but they are late bound. And so mm. when Yasha comes in to fulfill this, they were already bound by that law at that time. So he had to give them fish and 12 loaves of bread total to fulfill the 12 tribes of Israel being given bread and the quail that Yahweh fed them when they were hungry. And so that's how he fulfilled that part. So then when the dew lay around, it, they get, um, you know, the dew turned into manna and it was sweet to taste, blah, blah, blah. So they got the manna. And Yahweh told them in the 16th verse, this is the thing which Yahweh has commanded, gather of it every man according to his eating and omer for every man according to the number of your persons take ye every man for them which are in his tent so according to your person is what you're supposed to take to eat mm -hmm. so everybody's not eating the same portion right. i may be able to you know obtain more than so and so so and so but it's all according to what you can eat though and mm -hmm. the children of israel did so and gathered some more and some less and when they did meet it with an omer he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, let no man leave it until the morning. morning. With, notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms, and it stank. And Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass, that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, this is that which Yahweh had said, tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. Bake that which ye will bake today and see that ye will see and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink. So what was the difference then? Why when they left it over to the morning, the first through the fifth day, it bred worm and stink. But on the sixth day, when they left it over for the next morning, it didn't breed worm and it didn't stink. No, it be yes, the, the, word, the word of Yahweh. Be that's that's why, because of the word of Yahweh. Yahweh yeah. was testing and proving them. And Moses mm -hmm. said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto Yahweh. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Keep this in mind when we get to the 24th chapter of Exodus. Well, no, 20th chapter of Exodus. Sorry. And it came to pass that there went out some people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And Yahweh said to Moses, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that Yahweh hath given you the Sabbath, who did he give it to? Moses. Israel. Yahweh gave, Yahweh Israel. gave the Sabbath to Israel. He gave that to Israel. That's going to be important. Yahweh has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Um, and the house of Israel called um, the name of it manna, blah, 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 um, so forth and so on. And then he told, um, and so the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to the land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. So he rained down that manna from heaven um, the entire time they were in the wilderness. And so what is that talking about? Why is it like that? They didn't eat manna in, the, in Egypt. They didn't eat manna in Canaan land. So why was it in the wilderness for 40 years when they ate the manna? Because if you look at the tabernacle pattern, and the holy place is where you have the table of showbread that mm -hmm. has the 12 loaves of bread. And so mm -hmm. it can only be eaten mm -hmm. in the wilderness because it can only be eaten in the holy place. Because mm -hmm. Canaan land is like into the most holy That's place. Right. The, the wilderness of Sinai is like into the holy place. And Egypt is like the outer court. And so the bread can only be eaten in the holy place. So they could mm -hmm. only receive that bread in the wilderness of Sinai for those 40 years that they were there. Um, so then, let's keep moving. Um, now an omer is a tenth part of it. So before we get to that, part, so he, in 33rd verse, and Moses said unto Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before Yahweh to be kept for your generation. And as Yahweh commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now, this is before the tabernacle was built. 
And so Aaron took that pot of manna and it and kept it for all those years. And it never bred worms, it never sank. All of this was by the word of Yahweh. Yahweh was testing through it. All these things happened by the word of Yahweh. Right. That's right. Now, <clears throat> 17th chapter, water in the rock. All right. Anybody see anything in the 17th chapter of Exodus that they want to share? Oh, I got so many highlights. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So let's just go through it real quick. Um, 17th okay. chapter, this is where he was being tested. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of Yahweh, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. God, dog it. Look now. Y'all ain't learned yet. <laughs> Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Like Moses got water in his pocket. And Moses said unto them, why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt Yahweh? And the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses and said wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst and Moses cried unto Yahweh saying what shall I do unto this people they be almost ready to stone me and Yahweh said unto Moses go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river take it in thine hand and go behold I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, Yahshua is the rock by which the law and the prophets stand on. And he even told Peter, upon mm -hmm. this rock, and it talks about 1 Corinthians 10 chapter, that rock that led them, that rock was the Messiah. So Yahshua mm -hmm. being referred to as a rock, and they had to smite him. And when they pierced that rock in the side, out forth came blood and water. And he told the woman at the well, I am uh, living water. You should get living water for me. And after me, there should nobody thirst that drinks up this water. And so Yahshua fulfilled that when they had to smite him being the rock as well. So anyway. Um, so they smote the rock. So Moses smote the rock on the side of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of, of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh among us or not? What kind of mess is that after everything that Yahweh had done? Okay, mm. smart. And then smart came, at the mouth. Uh, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Yahshua, Choose out men. And go forth, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow will I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of Yahweh in mine hand. So Yahshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and her mm -hmm, went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand was heavy. And they took a stone, had to be a stone. And they took a stone and put it under him. Moses is the law, okay? Moses is the law. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he set their own. Moses set on the stone. And it talks about an axe. This is the stone that was set of you builders. Mm -hmm. This Yahshua is the stone. So <laughs> Yahshua is the stone. And Moses, they put the stone under Moses. And he set mm -hmm. their own, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands. The one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So you have Aaron on one side, her on the other side, holding up mm -hmm. Moses' hand. Two witnesses. Okay. The two witnesses. Aaron and her being the prophet, Moses being the law, and they were on the stone. And so that's where every, the foundation is laid. There should no other foundation be laid other than the law and the prophet. And that's talking about Yahshua. So anyway, and his hands were heavy and steady until the going down of the sun. And Yahshua did some fighting Amalek and his people. 
with the edge of the sword. And Yahweh said unto Moses, write this for a memorial and a book and rehearse it in the ears of Yahshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from heaven, from under heaven. And Moses built an offer and call, call, altar, excuse me, and called the name of it um, Yahweh Nisi. For he said, because Yahweh has sworn that um, Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So that's important too when Saul comes along and he's supposed to do what he's supposed to do with Amalek. So Yahweh said that Amalek had to be destroyed. 18th chapter. Ooh, another time. Um, so when so when Jethro, or Ruel, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that Yahweh had done for Moses and for the children of Israel, that Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt, Ruel, or Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife, Zipporah, after Moses sent her back in the fourth chapter of Exodus, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in the strange land. That's why he named him Gershom. And the name of the other son was Eliezer. For Yahweh, um, the elder of my father, said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh, which he's talking about when he had to flee from Pharaoh after he killed the Egyptians. And so that's why he named his two sons what he named them. Anyway, so Ruel, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife, and Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the Mount of Elohim. And he said unto Moses, I, um, so forth, so and so, this is when Jethro or Ruel is going to see how Moses actually, you know, has to do all the things with the children of Israel. How he has to, um, you know, judge them. And so he was like, Moses, what is this that you're doing? You're going to wear yourself out. And so he was like, um, you know, maybe you should do, you know, so forth and so on. Like, you know, why don't you just take um, different judges, people that have the spirit of Yahweh in them, and let them be over tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands or whatever, and then whatever large matter they bring it to you. Otherwise, you're going to wear yourself out. You're taking too much of point yourself. And so Moses talking to his father-in-law, and he did so. 19th chapter um, is where we want to be real quick. Anybody got anything in the 18th chapter before I just breathe through it? Just one thing, and <clears throat> just one thing in 18 uh, that Yahweh has showed us that <clears throat> it says Jethro, but we know it's not Jethro because no J, no Jesus, no Jethro. It, that's why she's saying Ruel. It's Ruel. It's father. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's his father. Right. No. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Where is that at? Where I can actually show that? Um, okay, so that would be 2 and 18 to prove that. Exodus 2 18, just to prove it real quick. I don't like leaving nothing hanging. Exodus 2 18, it says, and when they came to rule their father, this is after Moses came up out of Egypt, and the women that were at the well, the seven women at the well, he ran the shepherds off and he um, helped them more their fight. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how was it that you have come soon today? Blah, blah, blah. So that was his name, Ruel. Um, Moses' father-in-law's name was Ruel. But anyway. All right. Um, Exodus 19th chapter. Anybody got anything in the 19th chapter that they want to share? R-E-U-D-L. Hmm? I think there was something in the 19th. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, in the third month, um, the children of Israel, when they came out of uh, Egypt, they came up under Mount Sinai. So the third month, as it was explained earlier, being June, April, May, June, that means that, uh, um, you know, they were... Uh, they arrived at Mount Sinai, uh, and that's a, you know, a pretty important date in history. Uh, I think they arrived uh, on June 3rd, and Yahweh uh, told them to clean up for three days, and he would present and present himself before mm-hmm. Yahweh, and, and on June 6th wow. is when he spoke the law to the people. So, mm-hmm. and again, those are prophetic dates right there, wherein because June 6th corresponds to, as we talked about earlier, Yahshua Messiah being born on June 6th. Mm-hmm. It also corresponds to the day of Pentecost, 
uh, when Yahshua poured the Holy Spirit out uh, to the Jews there uh, on the day of Pentecost. That was on June 6th as well. So again, it's a very uh, prophetic date and very important to remember. Um, let me see. That's the one thing that stood out initially. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll just stop there for sake of time. Okay. Thank you. Very good. All right. So um, it says in the third month, which we know that's June because April is the first month, when the children of Israel were gone out of the land of Egypt, the same day, the same day means the same day is the same month. So if it's the third month, it's the third day. So that's what it means by the same mm-hmm. day. So the third month, the same day. So June 3rd, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And like um, he was saying, if you count from the time that the, the Passover was killed, the lamb was killed, there were three days to and through the Red Sea. So after the death, burial, and resurrection of the lamb, or the children of Israel, after they had the lamb in them, there were 50 days exactly from the time that they came through the Red Sea up until June 6th when the law was spoken to them on Mount Sinai. Just like after the death, burial, resurrection, he rose, Yahshua, he rose again on the third day. He carried the earth for 40 days. And then 10 days later, on June 6th, the day of Pentecost, he poured out the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of that. And so the third day of the same month, the third month, um, they had to depart from Rephidim and they would um, come to Mount Sinai. And Yahweh told them that in three days he would speak to them. And Yahweh is telling them, Moses went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the children of the house of Jacob. So this is the first trip that Moses takes into Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai, Moses took three different trips into Mount Sinai. This is the first trip when Moses was on the plateau of the mount. He wasn't at the he didn't go to the top yet, but he was on the plateau of the mount. Um it said Moses came unto, Yahweh came unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob. Um you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you should be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which Yahweh shall speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of Israel and laid before their faces all the words of Yahweh. And then the um, they answered all that Yahweh said, we will do. And so mm-hmm. Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. And so Moses told Yahweh, they said, whatever you say, Yahweh, that's what they're going to do. And Yahweh said to Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. The people may hear when I speak and believe thee um, forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moses, well, the people told them to sanctify themselves. Um, and they could not come at their wives. They'd be ready against the third day. But the third day, Yahweh will come again in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds. They couldn't even touch the mount. Not even a beast could touch the mount. If so, they had to be killed. And it's because the mount was holy. And so Moses went down, told the people what Yahweh said. Um, and then Mount Sinai was a smoke. Yahweh came and descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded alone and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and Elohim answered him by a voice. And Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and Yahweh called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And, the, and Yahweh said unto Moses, go down, try the people that can come through, so forth and so on. So, Moses went down and told them that they couldn't come through. So that's the first trip that Moses took to Mount Sinai. Second trip. The, um, and so this is what he said to them. So Yahweh spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh, I Elohim that brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of abundance. He started giving them the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make them to be any graven images. You shouldn't buy yourself down to them. Um, you know, Yahweh visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the first third and fourth generation, which is talking about something too. And then the eighth verse, this is important. The eighth verse says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, he could not say remember if he had not already told him about the Sabbath day. And so the world says that this is when he set up the Sabbath with them, and this is what the world talks about. No, in the 16th chapter, he set that up with Israel and Israel only. 
the world tries to take these commandments and make them theirs, but this is what Yahweh spoke to Israel. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh, thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maid servant, men servant, thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gate. He didn't say the whole world. He said those that are in within thy gate. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Now Moses wrote this. Um, after he had seen everything. Now, all this had happened, but he wrote all of this down. After this. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which Yahweh thy Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Nothing that thy neighbor has. And all the, th- all the people saw the thunder and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. They were afraid. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not Yahweh speak to us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for Yahweh is come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. He's doing that to, to y'all fear him, so you won't sin against him. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near into the, unto the thick darkness where Yahweh was. And Yahweh said unto Moses, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, you yes. have seen that I have talked with you from heaven, not the mount, but heaven. Why did he say heaven, even though he was on the mount? Because Yahweh is heaven itself. The, wherever his presence is, that, that's heaven itself. And so Yahweh, if he's magnified in your conscience or in your mind, you can walk around on heaven. And I mean, in heaven, while you walk around on earth, you can be in heaven right now. And so that's anyway. You shall not make with um, gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice their own thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Now that was then. Now the altar of earth that we have now are these earthly bodies that we have where we're supposed to be sacrificing to Yahweh within ourselves. And once we do that, in all the places where he records his name in us, he will come unto us and he will bless us. And if thou will make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build of it hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shall thou go up by steps unto mine altar, lest thou make it as do. So the 21st chapter, he starts speaking out the judgments to the people, same thing with the 22nd chapter. Um, there's so much in that, even with the ox being gore, gore in the people and all that, that was talking about Yahshua too, too much um, to go through now, but um, we run out of time. Then the 22nd chapter, thou should not do this, thou should not do that. He gave them all the judgments and laws. Um, thou should not read the false report. 23rd chapter, he's going through all of that, um, talking about the Sabbath and the land, all the judgments and things like that. So, um, 24th chapter. Here we go. Now, and then we're going to do the assignment. We're going to talk about the assignment. So 24th chapter, first verse, and Yahweh, and he said unto Moses, come up unto Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words of Yahweh, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning. But keep that in mind. Now, this is early in the morning that he's rising up. Moses rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience for the people. So all these things he's doing, even he started early in the morning, now he's doing all of these things. He sprinkled the blood of the people, um, read the book in the audience of the people, 
They said all that Yahweh said we would do and be obedient. He took the blood, sprinkled it on the people. He sprinkled it on the book um, and things like that. And then the night first, then after that, went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, seven of the elders of Israel, and they all saw the Elohim of Israel. Now, I mind you, all this time is passing from the morning when he started. They all saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and it were the body of heaven in its clearness. As it were, sorry. And then upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahweh said unto Moses, come up unto me in the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister, Yahshua. And Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. Now, Yahshua, what is he doing going up there with Moses? When Yahweh said nobody should go with Moses, Moses should come alone. Because Yahshua is the one that invited him up because that was Yahweh manifested in the body. And he mm-hmm. said unto the elders, tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matter to do, let him come unto them. And so if you know the story, they didn't waste any time after Moses went up in the clouds. Oh man, I ain't no telling what happened to Moses and Aaron came, and they came down off in the mountain and they built that golden calf. Yahweh told them, Moses told them to tarry there until they come back unto them. Right? And so instead of them being obedient, they tried to do what they wanted to do on their own before uh, Moses came down. Same thing in the fulfillment. When Yahshua told his disciples to tarry in the upper room until he comes back again unto them, what did they do? They wanted to cast lots and choose out who was going to take Judas's place instead. And that is not who Yahweh chose. But anyway, um, and he said unto the elders, tarry you here for us until we come again. Da, 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 da. Moses went up into the mount and the cl- um, into the cloud of the mount. And the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days colon. And it says, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So now on the first six days, he didn't call out to Moses until the seventh day. But in this verse, it doesn't say what happened in the six days. And it doesn't say what he said unto Moses when he called out to him. The next verse only says, and the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went in the midst of the cloud and got him up in the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and three nights. It doesn't say anything what happened the first six days or what Yahweh said unto Moses the seventh day. And it says the, that the cloud was a uh, devouring fire. So if that's the case, then we know it had to be in the evening time when Moses went up into the mount um, by himself. And so what happened on the first six days is when we would go to Genesis, the first chapter, to pick up the six mm-hmm. days that Moses saw in the mount. And that's why when we read Genesis, the first chapter, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. I want to pause here for just a second. So we know that whenever we're reading the Bible and things like that, we have blood, water, spirit, 40 principles, right? And so when we go back to the 24th chapter of Exodus, the only thing we see in this chapter is blood. When Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, we don't see anything about water or 40. Well, this is where you pick up your water spirit in 40 at. So we know that after he sprinkled the blood, then that's when he went up into the mount and he was up there for 40 days. So you got the blood in your 40, but then you go to Genesis, the first chapter to get your water in your spirit. So mm-hmm. in the, the, so the very next thing Moses saw after the blood, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was up on the face of the deep, and the spirit, that's your spirit, moved upon the face of the waters. So he had to see water and he had to see spirit right after the blood and he was up there for 40 days. So that's your blood, water, spirit, 40 in this particular event. And Elohim said, let there be light and there was light. He didn't have to say let there be darkness because darkness was already there. It was already evening time and dark and plus darkness was already there. Let there be light and there was light and Elohim saw the light that it was good and Elohim divided light from the darkness and Elohim called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Why did he not say morning and evening? Because at the time Moses saw this, this was in the evening time. And so Moses is just recording what he saw in the time frame that he saw it. 
So the evening mm-hmm. when you first went up into the mount and they saw the pillar of fire when Moses went up, that means it was evening time. The evening and the morning were the first day that Yahweh showed Moses. That was the first day out of the six days that Yahweh showed Moses in the mount. Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. And then we go all the way down to the seventh day. Um, let's see, where is it? Um, where is it? The child is it? And the evening one was the sixth day, next chapter in the King James Version. Keep reading in the holy name. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Now, the reason why Yahweh, several reasons he did this, he did it this way for one reason, is to show Moses why in the 16th chapter of Exodus, he told them to get a, um, to, on the sixth day to get a double portion because he wasn't going to rain out any manna on the seventh day. Now Moses is seeing why. Be- because before this, when Yahweh gave him the instructions on the 16th chapter about the sixth day and the seventh, Sabbath day, and in the 20th chapter gave them the law, about remember the Sabbath day. Now Moses is seeing why Yahweh had it set that way. On the seventh day, Elohim ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which Elohim created and made. And that's it for the first chapter of Genesis. It still does not say what he said to Moses after the seventh day that we read in the 24th chapter of Exodus. This is the, where you get what happened the rest of those days that he was up into the mount. You go to the 25th chapter of Exodus. And that's when it said, and Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying. So this is what he said to Moses when it talks about in the 24th chapter, what it says, and on the seventh day he called out unto Moses. This is what he said when he called out to Moses after the seventh day. And he spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel. So now he's going to give him the next 33 days of those 40 days. He's given to Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle. And so if we Mm -hmm. look at the 25th chapter of Exodus, it corresponds to the first day of creation. The 26th chapter of Exodus corresponds to the second day of creation, so forth Mm -hmm. and so on. So the assignment for next time we meet um, together will be to read Genesis, the first chapter, and then go back and read Exodus 25 through 31 and write a report on how the creation came in by the pattern. So if you can compare the first day of creation with the 25th chapter of Exodus, the second day of creation with the 26th chapter of Exodus, so forth and so on, you should be able to see those different um, vessels that he told Moses in the 25th chapter should correspond with what came about in the first day. Same thing with the second chapter, according to the second day, so forth and so on. So if you can read that with that in mind, looking for the correlation, then you should be able to come up with a report on it. And we'll discuss those reports the next time we meet. So that's the assignment for um, the basics of foundation science for not this Monday coming up, but the following Monday. So every other Monday we'll have this class. And if you say that, doing <coughs> tonight, you want to talk. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Say that mm-hmm. again. Say that again, Carla. <coughs> okay. So we're going to read Genesis, the first chapter, and then Exodus 25 through 31. And so we're going to, cor- we're going to correlate the 25th chapter with the first day of creation. And the 26th chapter, it goes with the second day of creation. 27 goes with the third day. 28 goes with the fourth day. 29 goes with the fifth day. 30 goes with the sixth day. And then the 31st chapter is when he kind of finished everything up. So if you read the 25th through the 31st chapters, you should be able to go back and correlate it to each day of creation um, where Yahweh showed Moses the creation by the pattern. And so this is what he was talking about in Romans 1, 19 and 20. For that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh showed it unto them. Um, you know, even the things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. And the reason why we know he was talking about Israel, if we keep reading, it talks about you know, what he shows them and things like that. So he was talking about Israel in uh, Romans 1, 19 and 20, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, them who? Israel. For yes. Yahweh mm-hmm. has showed it unto them. Right. For Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Yahweh 
uh, for the for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even you can even understand his eternal power and his eternal nature so that they are without excuse so nobody has an excuse because that when they knew Yahweh same day they glorified him not as Elohim neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was dark and professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible Elohim into an image made like to corruptible. He's talking about Israel, because that's what they did out there in the wilderness um, when Yahweh was, you know, giving them the instructions and things like that. So he's talking about Israel. But everything that you um, can know about Yahweh are clearly things being understood by the things that are made, by this tabernacle pattern that he gives to Moses. And so that will be the first assignment that we're going to do moving forward. And then we'll get off into the tabernacle some more when we come to class or um, the next time we meet for the basics and foundation class. So we'll do the reports first part of class, and then we'll start breaking down the tabernacle um, and have another assignment with the tabernacle um, the next time we come meet for the basics and foundation class. Any questions or comments? Did y'all learn something tonight? Yes. Next time. Oh, yeah. Very good class. Very good. I'm sorry. What was that? What was that, Miss Dibble? No, I said it was a very good class. Next time, oh, yeah. um, I'll make a comment on those trips. Something I was mm -hmm. wanting to say, but I know you were moving because there was so much to say and time was moving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No father okay. willing. Next time. Okay, no problem. All right, all right. Any other comments or questions? All right, hope y'all got your assignment. So um, Wednesday will be the next time we have our um, class. We have class on Wednesday from 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, that will be like a regular class that we have. The same link as our Sunday class will be Wednesday night, and then we'll have class again on Sunday, same time, 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, same Zoom link. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at Meridian Soul, S O H L, at gmail.com. If you want to look up any of the transcripts or any of the audios or conference calls, or even if you want to have a copy of the Elohim book, there's a digital copy on our website. You go to soulfood.org, S O H L which stands for School of Highest Learning, sohlfood.org to get all of those um, different things that you can use to study. If there's nothing else, we'll conclude with the doxology taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Sean, do you want to do doxology for me? All righty. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 <clears throat>